Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We are delighted to have you here for our third session of conference number two, Study the Land. My name is Jonathan Finkelstein, and I've been delighted to help host the event together with my colleague, Adam Lafaji. And to, tonight online with us, we have John Kress, who is joining us uh, to talk about the Caribbean from a very unusual setting this evening, not one that he perhaps expected. He will explain in a moment. Um, but uh, I won't literally steal his thunder, because you'll find out what we mean about the thunder in just a moment. But before we introduce John and our topic for today, I did want to thank all of the partners that have made our conference and the entire Shout project possible. Smithsonian is joined by Microsoft Partners in Learning and Taking It Global to bring you this series of live events and all of the various opportunities to connect and to act around each of these topics. I'll review some of those many ways with you at the very end, uh, give you a few highlights of ways to continue the conversation. We do hope that you will take the time today to share with us your questions and your thoughts, and I will convey those to John, um, our speaker, John Kress, as we go along today. And um, But I would love to have you introduce yourselves, and you can type into the chat box on the left a little bit about yourself. We do know that um, some of you are joining us for the first time today, and others are back again for session number three. So either way, it's a good time to let uh, others know a little bit about yourself, where you're from, where you're joining us from, and maybe even a little bit about your interest in the topic. Um, and we would like to know one quick question, which is how many people are watching this webcast with you at your location from your computer? And to that end, you can just move your mouse over to the center of the screen and quickly click on the poll option that best describes the number of people with you and hop back over onto the left side where you were introducing yourself and continue that. Good. Well, we've got a lot of people who are uh, on their own uh, for this session, but we also have a number of groups joining us too. So we hope the groups will feel empowered to jump in and share the keyboard and, uh, and the polling areas as we go along. Um, I don't want to take up much more time because battery life is uh, our friend that we hope this evening. Um, uh, I say this evening because it is the evening here on the East Coast. Uh, I did want to quickly point out that our illustrator will be illustrating the session. Here is uh, an illustration of our first session earlier today on uh, this Shout conference. And you'll be seeing drawings like this for John Cress's session as well. So we want to thank Chris Wilson, our artist for capturing these drawings. I'll show you a glimpse of the one from session number two as we wrap up today. So with that, I'm going to turn to John Kress, joining us from the dark, somewhere in the Washington, D.C. area, to uh, tell us a little bit about what he will be talking about today and to kick things off. John. All right, here I am, sitting in Washington, D.C., really wishing I was in the tropics because I'm conducting this shout session, and it's, it's really great to be part of this. I thank uh, Adam and Jonathan for setting it up. But I'm sitting here in the dark because Washington is enveloped in a giant snowstorm, including thunder and lightning, and the power just went off in the entire region. And I'm looking out at snow covering everything. And uh, I'll see what I can do here, as long as my flashlight Hold out, then I think I'll be able to get through the talk. So let's let's start. I'm going to, since I can't really see my computer screen, since there's no power, I'm going to run through this little presentation about plants and animals and how they interact and how they adapt and how they sustain or help us sustain our natural heritage and see if we can make this work. So I think we're on slide one right now, and the title is Charles Darwin and the Islands: Evolution, Adaptation, and Sustain Our Natural Heritage. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're going to go through a little presentation, first starting with Darwin, and then all about the islands and plant-animal interactions, and particularly pollination. So if we go to the next slide, I'll, there you can see Charles Darwin himself. Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, if we can say that, uh, published his great uh, work in the middle of the 1800s, over 150 years ago. Uh, recently, we celebrated his birthday and the publication of The Origin of the Species. But Darwin was the first to really begin to understand how plants and animals, and us as well, have adapted to the environments uh, that we find ourselves in. Uh, he was particularly interested in how plants and animals adapt to each other. In fact, he wrote a book on this in 1816 here, called On the Various Contrivances by Which British and Foreign 
orchids are fertilized. And here's an example of what he showed. Uh, he had many examples in his book, actually, and most of them were from orchids in his native uh, Britain in the UK. But this was an example he brought up of an orchid there, as you can see. And you can see hanging down below the flowers, uh, this is called a Madagascar orchid, uh, are these long tubes, and those are called floral tubes, and those are filled with nectar. And Darwin predicted, although he had never been to Madagascar, he predicted that there would be a long-tongued insect probably visit these flowers that had a tongue as long as those tubes. And if you click on the next picture, you see come up a photo of, indeed, a number of years later, a botanist and an entomologist working in Madagascar found the moth that actually visited and pollinated this flower. So Darwin had predicted it based upon his theory of evolution. And indeed, that's what we find today. Go to the next slide. Flowers are pollinated everywhere in the world, whether it's in the Arctic or area where there's, there are some flowering plants, or the temperate zones, such as Washington, D.C., or New York, or California, and also, obviously, in all the plants in the tropics. Uh, and it's in the tropics where we have the most diverse, and really the most interesting pollination system. Uh, and so this slide shows you a number of different animals, what we call tropical pollen vectors, and vector just meaning uh, animals that transfer pollen from one flower to the next. Um, and that's what pollination is really about, is taking the pollen, which are really the male gametes, and transferring them to the female part of the flower. The male gametes pollinate, or excuse me, fertilize the female eggs in the flowers, and as they, they produce seeds and fruits. And it's in the tropic where we have the most diverse thing. And if you look here, you see everything from bees and beetles and moths and uh, hummingbirds and sunbirds and bats and even lemurs up in the right-hand corner there is a black and white rough lemur from Madagascar, which a number of years ago we showed actually pollinates a big flower there. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is a little schematic of eight groups of plants that I've been spending a good chunk of my career uh, over the last 30 years uh, studying how the plants interact with the pollinators or the animals that pollinate them. And there are eight different families here. At the very bottom, you can see something that looks like a banana. Indeed, the bananas are part of this group. Uh, the birds of paradise, we kind of work our way from right to left. A group called heliconias, and there's the gingers, and the uh, costaceae, and pear plants, and then the cannas. Some of you may be familiar with these, and I'll show you pictures of them. But those are the groups of plants we're going to be talking about tonight, and how various animals have adapted to pollinating their flowers. The next slide. It's just, again, a summary slide with some of the same photos I showed you earlier to indicate that within this group, the Zinja Borales, and that's just the, what we call the order of plants that all these fall in, uh, almost anything that flies has been recorded visiting members of the Zinja Borales. That is, insects, whether they're beetles, flies, bees, moths, or butterflies, or whether they're vertebrates, animals, whether they're bats, birds, lemurs, or even tree shoes. Prove that yet. What I want to talk about tonight, if we go to the next slide, is one particular system there, and that's between the Heliconias, and these again are in this order, Zingiberales, and they all have brightly colored flowers and inflorescences, and then also they're all pollinated by hummingbirds. This photo of a Heliconia from South America being visited by this very colorful hummingbird. Uh, a friend of mine named John Thompson from the University of California recently published a book called The Coevolutionary Mosaic of Heliconias and Hummingbirds. Actually, he published a book uh, there it's called On Coevolution, and I'm adapting that to look at the coevolutionary mosaic of Heliconias. Um, what is coevolution? Well, evolution is the adaptation of a species to a particular environment. Coevolution is the co-adaptation to different species to each other. That's what we mean by coevolution. Let's go to the next slide. So, what do we do, or what do I do as a botanist, a tropical botanist at the Smithsonian, when I go out and try to study plants and animals, particularly in the tropics? Well, here's a slide of a little cabin I lived in for a year in the country of Costa Rica, uh, where I was studying this interaction between the heliconias and the hummingbirds. Uh, click on the next uh, slide, another two examples of. of kind of 
field studies that shows you what we have to do, and namely, uh, we have to kind of manipulate the flowers in certain ways and see how the pollinators or the suspected pollinators actually interact. So we often cover the inflorescences. Inflorescence is just a long stream or a, a long structure that contains the flowers. We can cover them with bags, as you see here, two different species of Floconia. And then see how the pollinators react and do various experiments. And that way, we can find out how evolution occurred and how these plants and animals adapted to each other. Next slide. Uh, this is a slide by a very good friend of mine, Phil Savoy, who's a photographer uh, for the BBC, or, or was at one point. This shows us a, a, a close-up of a hummingbird on the right. You can see its long bill that's piercing or uh, entering the flower of a heliconia. And the red part you see there is what's called a bract, and that's just a kind of an enclosing structure in which the flowers are, are um, developed. And the flowers stick out of there, and the yellow part is the actual flower. And what you can see, that long bill of the hummingbird sticking in the flower. And we've been studying these sorts of interactions for, oh, maybe 20 or 25 years. And what we found is that length and the curvature of that bill very important in terms of the, are very closely related to the length curvature of that flower. And you can see they fit pretty well here. And John, this is, out. Uh, yep. John, it's, this is uh, Jonathan. It's a beautiful photograph. Um, and we did ask people as they're looking at it, what do they think is on the bird's head in this photograph? And we're already starting to get some responses. And uh, uh Catherine, Anybody get it right? I believe so. We have uh, Catherine in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, was the first person to ask, is it pollen? And Rebecca Schulters uh, came in with the same answer. Are they correct? They are right. And what happens is that you can see there's these little white anthers, and those contain the pollen in the flower. And they sift out that pollen right on the very uh, base of the bill of the hummingbird. Uh, and then the hummingbird will the nectar from that flower and then go on to another flower and transfer that pollen that's all over its head, the other flower, and that's how fertilization or pollination and then fertilization occurs. What we found in these systems is each species of heliconia places pollen on a different part of the hummingbird. Some of them right there at the base of the bill, as you can see it, some on the top of the head, some on the chin, some on the side of the head. And in that way, they ensure that the pollen of that particular flower gets to the pollen of the another flower of the same species. So often these hummingbirds will pollinate different heliconias uh, at the same time. All right, let's, look, I could show you a lot of still photos of heliconias and hummingbirds, but it really helps if you can see this whole system in action. So let's go to the next slide. And what I have is a little video clip here uh, that came out of a BBC film called Hotel Heliconia. And they've allowed me to use these uh, to show people how heliconias and hummingbirds interact. So this first clip here is uh, a species of heliconia called Heliconia wagneriana, and you can see it in the background there. And it is pollinated by what's called the Br Bronzy Hermit Hummingbird. So let's start this clip. It only takes about a minute. And of course, I'm in the dark here in Washington and can't see it, so uh, we'll just take a look. But uh, I think I can remember what's going on. But the first thing you see is the, heliconia, uh, the hummingbirds looking around. It finds a flower, it, it hovers around that flower, and then it will stick its bill way down into the flower, twisting its head. And in that way, it sucks nectar out of the bottom of the flower with its bill and tongue. Pollen is put on uh, the head, as you can see. Now, is the, is the video over yet? Uh, I actually had started it just a little bit early, so I went back to uh, match up your description. And it's, it's uh, just wrapping up right now. OK. Yeah. So the first thing you see about this, and you have to run it again, you just look at the last part of it, uh, the last frame, is the curvature of that bill, that long curved bill of the bronzy hermit actually fits the long flower of that heliconia. Pollen is placed on a particular uh, part of the bird. So let's go to the, the next slide, the next little video clip. All right. And this is a different hummingbird. Uh, the, the first one was also the hummingbird and heliconia were both from Costa Rica. And this is another pair of species. This is heliconia longa and the sickle-billed hummingbird. And let's start running that clip. 
again, I don't have the clip in front of me, but if you look, uh, you see that why is this bird called the sickle bill? Well, it's pretty obvious when it pulls its bill out of that flower, it's extremely <laughs> curved. And again, just like the previous example, this hummingbird, this heliconia, actually, uh, the, the hummingbird the size and the shape of the bill fits the size and the shape of the uh, flower. I'm going to do something right here to help along here. I, actually, I have the PowerPoint uh, on my own computer, which is still running on its battery, so we can look at these things together. Great. So the first thing you notice, sticking them with this heliconia longa and the sickle bill hummingbird, is unlike the previous example, this bird doesn't hover. It actually perches on the flower, on those bracts, those red parts, and sticks its bill into the flower and sucks up the nectar. And that's, that's very different from the behavior of the other hummingbird, which actually hovered around the flower. So right there, there's a difference. Also, there's a different placement of the pollen on this hummingbird. So we're beginning to see how different heliconias and hummingbirds fit together. And, and John, if I might interrupt, there's a great comment from Josh, our earlier speaker from today, from Cirque. Josh Falk says, it makes you realize how connected things are. Imagine if the heliconia went extinct. We, we had a, a question from one of our participants earlier today. Why, why should we care whether one particular plant species of millions goes extinct. And uh, I think Josh's point about the interconnectedness here is, is quite relevant. It, it certainly is. And after we look at one or two more examples, I'll tell you why it's particularly relevant on these heliconias and hummingbirds. So let, let's go to the next video clip. And that's, this is a third uh, system. This is a heliconia imbricata. And that's, a, again, the plant on the left. You can see the crown wood nymph, which is a much smaller hummingbird. And before we even start the uh, clip, what you can see is this is a smaller bird, and it has a very straight, short bill. So let's, let's get that clip going, take a look at it. And here again, you can see the hummingbird hovers. This crown wood nymph is a hover when it visits the flowers of Heliconia imbricata. You also see that while it sips the nectar, the, the pollen gets placed on its bill, not on its head not on its cheek, not at the base of the bill, but right in the middle of the bill. So it's a very specific placement. So that was a pretty quick one. Mm -hmm. um, now let's, let's go to the next slide. So those are the three clips. And I hope that gives you some idea of what these hummingbirds uh, look like when they're actually visiting the flowers. And all this happens in the tropics. Of course, we do have hummingbirds here in the temperate zone also. On the east coast of the US, we have one hummingbird that comes up here, the uh, uh, ruby throat. And, on the west coast, if you're there, on that side of the continent, there's a number of hummingbirds that you might see during the flowering season there. But in the tropics, it's where we have many hummingbirds and many heliconias uh, and plants that are visited. OK, the next slide is back to the slides again. And here is that interconnectedness that Jonathan just brought up. Uh, and even though I showed you one hummingbird visiting one heliconia and three different instances of that, Really, what we really usually find when we, we're in the rainforest of Costa Rica is we find that there are a number of species of hummingbirds that visit a number of species of heliconia. And that's why they have to be really specific about where they put the pollen. Otherwise, we get a lot of hybridization, and species would start to fall apart and things like that. So these are what we call guilds, just mean groups of pollinators and plants. And we basically have two. One is the hermit. Humming, hummingbirds, and those are the ones that have those long curved bills, the bronzy hermit and the sickle bill that we saw. And then there's the non-hermit hummingbirds, and these are the ones that have the shorter straight bills. And the flowers of the heliconias, species that match either the hermits or non-hermits, are, the, are, are, are fit the same bill, so they're short straight flowers or long curved. That was kind of the story about heliconias and hummingbirds that we knew up until a few years ago until we started on a different system. Go to the next slide. Oh, be, before we, we talk about the work that we're doing in the Caribbean, this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but it's about the co-radiation. And that just means how plants diversify and how the hummingbirds diversify. And what we've done is we've figured out the evolutionary patterns of how the hummingbirds um, on the right side and the heliconias on the left side of the slide, how they actually diversified and when diversified. And what we found is the hummingbirds begin to, to break up into different species, a lot of species, over 300 species in 
the world today about 18 million years ago, as you can see. Now, a similar sort of analysis, but just on the plants, shows that the Heliconias started to diversify and speciate, is the term we use, about 22 million years ago. So this is very closely uh, associated with each other. So we really think that the hummingbirds and the Heliconias both evolved uh, very closely. If anybody has any questions about that, you can shoot it uh, in, and we can see if we can answer it. So let's go to the next slide. I want to talk to you about this very special thing that we found in the Caribbean, which is where I wish I was right now rather than in Washington, D.C. in the middle of a snowstorm. <laughs> uh, and this is a system that uh, we've been studying for about the last decade. And this is where, instead of having many species in a habitat, of both hummingbirds and heliconias like we have in Costa Rica or Panama or Colombia, in the eastern Caribbean here, and this is what we call the eastern arc, or the Lesser Antilles, which goes all the way from St. Kitts and Seba in the north, all the way down to Trinidad and Tobago in the south, map there. What we found is on most of those islands, there's only two heliconias, two species of heliconia, and there are pictures in the bottom there. The red one is called Heliconia carabia, and the greenish yellow one is called Heliconia beehive. And what's interesting is those two species are pollinated by only a single species of hummingbird. That's the purple-throated carob, which is on the top there. And the botanical name of that, or excuse me, the, the Latin name of that is Ulampus jugularis. And you can see it has kind of a similar a long curved bill of the hermit hummingbirds in Central and South America. Let's go to the next slide. And just to let you know that this work, almost all biological work, is not done by a single person. This is a photograph of some of the team that we've been work that we've had working in the Caribbean. Uh, Dr. Vanita Gouda received her PhD here in Washington at George Washington University, working with me, and she now is a postdoc. On the right side is Dr. Silvana Martin, who's from Costa Rica, and has a position in Veracruz, Mexico, right now as a tropical ecologist. And she was a postdoc on the project. And in the middle there is myself. Uh, the blue shirt, and with the light blue shirt is Dr. Ethan Tomeles, who is a professor at Amherst College. And he's the one that first really discovered this system and then brought me in as the botanical expert. And we've been studying together for the last uh, 10 years. Ethan is a hummingbird ecologist. So to do any study like this, you really need a team working together on different aspects of it. It's, our results really are much better than if you were doing this alone. OK, let's go to the next slide. And I just thought I'd put up a little photo of a flower of Heliconia, because mostly when you've seen the flowers here, they've been hidden inside these bracts. And I just put this up so you can see the whole thing. And it goes way up on the top right. That's the very top. And you can see the amp pollen there. And then there's this long curve thing called a corolla. And that's where the hummingbird sticks its bill in. And then at the very bottom of the flower, you can see something called the nectar chamber. And that's where all the nectar, the sweet sugar, solution that the flower produces and the hummingbird needs for its energy. That's where all that is uh, produced. And that forces the hummingbird to stick its bill way in and then its tongue into the nectar chamber. So those are the important parts of the flower. Next. Now, what was really exciting about this system, first of all, we were, we were excited to find the two Heliconia species that were only visited by one hummingbird. Remember, in, the, in Costa Rica, there are many hummingbirds that visited many species. Uh, so it wasn't species specific. But here in the, the Caribbean, it was pretty specific with just the purple threaded care of visiting these two species. But what we found when we really started looking closely was even more exciting. And what we found is if you look at the top here, the purple threaded carob is a hummingbird that we call is sexually dimorphic, meaning that the males are different than the females. And you can see how they're different here. The females, which have small bodies, have this long curved bill. And the males on the right side, which have much larger bodies than the females, about 25% larger, uh, they have these short straight bills. And what was even more exciting was the females only visited Heliconia beehive, and the males only visited Heliconia carabia, because that was the only flowers that it could get its bill in and get the nectar out. So not only do we have a species, very species specific system, but we have a sex system, and this had never been documented before in terms of plants and pollinators. 
And John, we thought this might be a good time to ask um, our colleagues and friends joining us, why do you think males and females visit different flowers? I guess there's the, we could think of this question from more than one angle. Uh, one is perhaps the reason that you just described, it's just where their beaks fit. <laughs> but perhaps the other right. part of the question is evolutionarily, why might males and females visit different flowers? That's a very good point. We always have to differentiate between those what we call ecological interactions, which is just because the interaction between the shape and curvature of the bill fitting into a flower, kind of a lock and key mechanism, and then the evolutionary aspect is how this whole system evolved over the last 20 million years. Those are some of the questions we're trying to actually answer in our studies in the Caribbean. So all of you out there think about maybe why males and females would specialize on different flowers, and you can see if we maybe get to some of those answers as we go on in the talk. Great. Okay, let's go to the next slide, and I just want to show you a, a couple of things. Uh, here were just some numbers. Uh, are the slide you're looking at, does it say St. Lucia at the top? It does. Okay, good. I just want to make sure my PowerPoint is the same as what you're seeing there. Um, and what we've done is we've gone from island to island in the eastern Caribbean there, starting, as I said, in Ceiba and St. Kitts in the north and working our way down to Trinidad and Tobago to see how this system is between the purple-throated carob and the hummingbirds, actually how it works on each of those islands. We thought it might work the same, and it turns out it's not the same on each island. Uh, here on St. Lucia, you can see there's the male. They do visit the carabias that have one color, red, and the females visit the beehive, which has that greenish color. We go to the next slide. On the island of Dominica, which is a little north of St. Lucia, uh, things start getting a little bit more interesting. Here, the Caribbean, the Heliconia Caribbean on the right has changed colors. There's a yellow form now, as well as a red form, so there's two different forms of Heliconias. Or, uh, yeah, Heliconia Caribbean, visited by these males with the short straight bills, and only one form of the Heliconia beehive, a red form rather than a green form, visited by the female. Next. So what we're, we're finding is that the system actually changes a little bit from island to island, and that's the evolution part. Um, and so what we're doing now is concentrating particularly on the island of Dominica to look more at the details of the system to see if we can understand why different color forms would evolve with these heliconias. So here's the players we're talking about on Dominica. Dominica is right in the middle of the chain. It's a very mountainous island. It's a relatively young island, a lot of cloud forest and rainforest, you can see in the foot of there. The Heliconias are down below. The Caribbean, there's a, a red form and a yellow form in the very center is the Heliconia beehive, and then the hummingbird, the purple-throated carob is on the left there. So what we found is, first of all, and you can continue to think about that question of why males and why females would visit different species, here is what happens in Heliconia carabia that is visited by the males. If you look up on the right, there's the male uh, with the short straight bill. And it turns out the males are the ones that visit Caribbean. And what they do is they actually defend territories around how a big clumps of Heliconia Caribbean. In the bottom right corner, you can see a, uh, what we call a, a little stand or a territory of Heliconia Caribbean with a lot of flowers and inflorescences. And the male keeps all the other hummingbirds all the other males, and even the females, out of this territory, and they keep it only for themselves. Heliconia carabias are primarily in the lowland rainforest of Dominica. Once in a while, though, the males will let a female, which is on the left side here, which we call intruders, they'll let this female intrude into the territory and visit a few flowers. Then they'll eventually chase her off. Thinking, why would this male let this female into the territory. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and this is what's happening in the other species of Heliconia, Heliconia beehive. The Heliconia beehive occurs at higher elevations. Plants are scattered. They never grow in these big clumps. And they're never visited by the males, which is why we have the red X on them in the right corner. They're only visited by the females. And instead of defending territories, these females do what we call trap line. And they just fly between a standard pattern of, of flowers or plants. And you can see the arrows take us around that trap line female. 
And then they'll do that hour after hour after hour all day long. So they're transferring pollen from one plant to the next in this trap lining fashion, which is really quite different than the territoriality of the males. So here we have not only different bills, sizes and shapes of the males and females, but also different behavior at the heliconias, the two different heliconias they visit. If you have any questions about that, you can uh, send them in. Now, what I'd like to do again is, if, uh, if you look at the next slide, I've got one more final uh, video clip of what's going on with the purple-threaded carob. And if you click on that now, and this was a, a video made again by the BBC called Plant Life, and they again have allowed me to use this uh, to describe what's going on in the system. So let's start the video. Uh, and this was fitted. So here you can see the uh, highlands of Dominica with the cloud forest. Here's Heliconia carabia. And we're just going to see carabia in this little film clip. See how it looks. And each of those red things is a bract. And you can see the little green flowers inside those bracts. There we go. And each bract will have one open flower on a day. Less. Oh, there goes an ant. And there's the pollen again inside the flower. And here's the male purple-threaded carob that long tongue. So it's not just the bill that goes in there. It's also the tongue that sticks down and laps that nectar. And here he comes. What a beautiful photograph, beautiful footage of this bird. And you can see it's sticking its bill down into the flower. Here comes another one. Slow motion photography is just great. Here's one. Now look at this. It's a little bit different. Remember, she, look, she's hovering. And then she actually stops hovering and uh, hangs on to the bract because this is a female that the male let intrude into the flowers. I was going to go chase her off. There, he just chased her off. She had to perch because her bill is so long and so curved that she can't get it into that flower without sitting in on the bract. And here's the male now back on his turret. Here he goes. OK, is that over there on that side? Yeah, it's just wrapping up. Very well timed. Oh, okay. So really an exciting system. If, if any of you ever have a chance to go to an island like Dominica in Caribbean, you can go and find these heliconias along the roadside. It's not hard to find these things. And you can sit there. And if you're there between March and May, you'll see all this happening. It just took us, Ethan and myself and Vanita and uh, Silvana and others, to just go there and actually take the time to sit and watch this thing to find out exactly what was happening. Let's go to the next slide. Hard to find my slides in the dark here. Oops. OK, let me see what's next. OK, so this slide is telling us exactly what's, why the males are letting these females uh, in, intrude into their territories. And what we found is the males are defending these territories not only for their own energy, and taking the nectar out of the plants for their own energy. But they're actually using the Heliconia carabias as attractants for the females to have sex with them. So they let the females come in and feed a little bit. They assess, if, is this a good female? Does she look strong? Does she have good, good babies? Or is it not a female that the male would want to mate with, and then he chases her off? If it is a female that he finds attractive and thinks it's a good offspring, then he'll let her visit a number of flowers. They'll do a little dance, then they'll mate, and then the female will fly off. And what we have found, and, and there's two graphs at the bottom of this uh, slide. On the right is just we, we tracked a number of males, and they're along the bottom there. So there was the yellow male, that's Y, and the blue male, and the uh, PI male, and the WPI male, and the red male, and the RB. We tracked how many times these males actually mated in their territories, and you can see and that's on the, the left-hand side, the percent matings. You can see the Y male had matings much more frequently than, than any of the other males. Some males didn't mate at all, and other males only had a few matings. So what it shows is, and this is evolution in action, that some males are more what we call fit, that they have more matings and leave more offspring. But the interesting thing we found on the right graph, a little hard to understand, but along the bottom is how much standing crop of nectar there is, so it goes from a little bit on the left to a lot on the right. And the, the bar on the, the x or the y-axis on the top is 
the relative fitness. That's the number of matings. And you can see as the amount of nectar increases, as we go to the right, the number of matings goes up. So the males that had the best territories with the most nectar had the most matings. So there's a direct relationship between the heliconias and the nectar they produce, territories that the male defend, and the mating success um, with females. Let's go to the next slide. And one more exciting thing, and we'll start to wrap some things up here. Um, an exciting thing we really found, and I keep telling you about all these exciting things, but they are for evolutionary biologists like myself, is we found that these territories, what the male was actually doing, he wasn't randomly uh, just defending some inflorescences for his own nectar and other inflorescences for the females, but he actually had specified parts of his territory. And you can see that the diagram here, what it's showing is the green circle is the entire territory. And what the male has done, he's partitioned that territory into ones that he only feeds on, and that's the red uh, broken circles on the right. And then the parts of the inflorescence are the parts of the territory that he, he just lets the females come and visit. We call this nectar farming for sex, because the males are actually farming those flowers for particular purposes, whether it's for their own energy or to actually attract these females. So the more we look at this system, actually, the more exciting it gets to be. Uh, and what we've found here, we won't, I won't go into too much detail, but at the different inflorescences, and each one of these bars represents an inflorescence represents how many times a male or a female visited these inflorescences. And it's just another proof that they are partitioning their territories into flowers that are primarily visited by the males for energy and flowers that are primarily visited by females for sex. OK, we're starting to really wrap things up here. As I said, we've been working throughout the whole Caribbean from the uh, north to the south. And we're finding different things on different islands. And here is just the different color forms of the heliconias that we find. And if you start way up in the north, you see on the island of uh, Saba and St. Kitts, only a yellow heliconia is found. As you go further south, and suddenly both heliconias are found, the heliconia beehive, which is on the left here, and the heliconia carabias. They have multiple color forms. And you get way down to the south in Grenada and Trinidad and Tobago. And in fact, there's only one heliconia there, heliconia beehive of these two species, and Caribbean drops out. So we're studying just how exactly these things change from island to island, and how just a little bit of isolation, just maybe 20 miles between Dominica and Martinique, or between Martinique and St. Lucia, has allowed these different systems to evolve. And let's the next series of slides just show that. If we look at Dominica, when we just look at Heliconia beehive, there the, it only Heliconia beehive in the island of Dominica, only visited by female purple throated carabs. Next slide. If we go way down to the other end, where there's no carabia and just beehive, we find that there are now six species of hummingbird that visit the flowers of beehive. And the flowers are very different. They're much shorter and less curved. And I won't go into the details. But each island, again, has a different system. So next slide, we'll just look at this, how it happens. The Heliconia carab uh, beehive, excuse me, uh, start their smaller plants with longer flowers in the north. They get larger in the south, whereas the flowers get smaller. So there's a disconnect between the size of the inflorescence and the size of the flower. And we know then that this is how selection acts. Look at the hummingbirds on the other side. Beehive, as I said earlier, is only visited by females in Dominica. But as you go south to the southern islands, then more and more hummingbirds are visiting plants, and the flowers change to accommodate all of them. And you can see it in, in the bottom, the six hummingbirds that visit the flowers in Trinidad and Tobago, they all have different shapes and sizes of bills. So this flower is going to have to be smaller and straighter if it's going to actually accommodate all these different bills. And one more click on the slide there. So we're going from a system that we call very specialized in the north with just one sex, one plant, one species, down to a very generalized system in South with one species of heliconia, but many species of hummingbirds. And here we see that geographic mosaic again. I'll go to the next slide. And I just wanted to bring up something to bring this back to Darwin. Uh, 
many of you probably have heard that Darwin had many insights about evolution when he uh, visited the Galapagos Islands on his voyage around the world in the 1830s. And it was the in one of the inspirations for him writing on the origin of species. And in the Galapagos Islands, which are off the coast of Ecuador, he found that each island had a different species of finch, which is a bird that has these bills you can see on the top. And each of those bills was specialized for a different, to feed on something different, whether it was seeds or insects or cactus or various different uh, things. And so our system in the Caribbean is somewhat similar to Darwin's uh, finches in the Galapagos, because we have these hummingbirds, not finches, but hummingbirds, being very specialized in their bills changing depending upon what they're feeding on. In fact, there is a perspective about our work in this magazine called Science in which they name these hummingbird Darwin's hummingbirds because of their similarity to Darwin's finches. Okay, go to the next slide. And I just wanted to make one more point here, that when we are working on research at this places like the Smithsonian, whether it's CERC or whether it's uh, that you heard about earlier in the day, or whether it's our Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, we really try to turn our research into stories that we can tell non-specialists uh, like many of you that are listening to this. After we've done, done this work, a number of people at the Smithsonian who also work on co-evolution and animal interactions, we decided to pool all our information and we opened up a new hall called Partners in Evolution, which we actually have a butterfly house with living butterflies that specialize on various plants. And now visitors to the museum can find out about the studies we're doing in the Caribbean, as well as just our scientific colleagues that read about this scientific magazine. So I invite you all to come to the Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C., and where you can learn not only about Partners in Evolution, but can learn about diversity of mammals and the diversity of dinosaurs and gems and minerals, as well as uh, different cultures around the world. Uh, and that's the slides. And that's kind of the story I'd like to uh, tell you tonight. And I guess if there are some particular questions that Jonathan would like to shoot my way, yes. I'd happy to answer them. Well, first of all, thank, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's... Uh, it's amazing on so many levels to hear you describe and tell the story and tie it back to the uh, the wisdom and the prescience of, of Darwin and to uh, to what you've been studying today. Our participants are being invited uh, to take part in a number of different challenges um, that relate to our sessions throughout uh, today. And one of those challenges is about getting involved in conservation. It's hard not to look at the amazing system uh, that has evolved among these uh, birds and these flowers. Um, uh, are, should there, is there anything that people should know about um, in terms of conservation, about this very particular example you gave us? Uh, how well, it, uh, yes, this might go back also to your question of inter interrelatedness. Mm -hmm. uh, of, so what if a species goes extinct? Well, as you can see here, that these plants and animals are all dependent upon each other in terms of their everyday life. Uh, whether it's for nectar or for sex or for mating or reproducing. And if one of the partners, if we lose one of the partners, clearly the other partner is going to be affected. And in many cases, depending upon how that, uh, how specific that interaction is, clearly affect how uh, both partners are affected if one species or the other is threatened with extinction or actually goes uh, We are studying right now uh, at the Smithsonian what happens to these interrelationships when species go extinct and how that is actually being affected by climate change. So even though a lot of our work is really just focused on describing the basic evolutionary biology or how these systems evolve, we're also very interested and concerned about how these things will be maintained in the future, not only for people to see and understand, but for the maintenance Amazing. We we have uh, you. Your the question you just raised is one that Anita from Fairfax uh, raised, uh, which is indeed how would global warming or pollutants, air pollutants, affect the whole idea of co-adaptation and uh, co-evolution that you that you talked about. So it sounds like this is, of course, a, a prime area of and a current area of study. Sure. Let, let me. Can I answer that one? Please do. Yeah. Uh, and it's a very good question. 
and what we're finding in the tropics right now, in fact, tomorrow I have a postdoc that's leaving for Costa Rica to look at this very thing. What we're finding is, as the temperature seems to be rising, is species that, let's say, live up the mountainside, they tend to migrate up the mountainside to cooler environments that are kind of like their, their natural environments, but as the, as the temperatures heat up, they begin to track up the mountainside, so they're moving higher and higher up the mountainside uh, as, the, as the climate gets warmer. Well, what happens when they get to the top, like the Seliconia beehive and females that are at the tops of the mountains? That's going to be very difficult for them. They have nowhere really to go once they get to the top, and that we're trying to find out, can they adapt to these things over the course of years, when they normally take millions of years to adapt, or will they indeed go extinct? So those are some of the questions. Uh, here's a couple of uh, other questions. Donna in Rockville says, I, I see the disadvantage, but is there an evolutionary benefit of having only one pollinator species per plant? Sure. The benefit is, and we need some more data to show this, and that's why we're looking at mating and seed set and all these things, is you have an assur assured pollinator. You've got a very specialized relationship, and we know the females can't live without the heliconia beehives, so they're certain to visit every flower. Whereas the males may be a little bit less so when they're defending those territories with a lot of flowers, more flowers than they actually need. So there certainly is a benefit to being specialized, but it's also kind of a risky strategy, and that's the kind of balance of evolution, adaptation. How do you assure some things, but don't get so specific that you're actually at a risk of going extinct? Uh, thanks, John. Uh, one, I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to one of the other challenges that we're asking people to think about um, while we're on this topic. Uh, one of the things we're asking our students who are participating to think about is, how can you tell if a plant species is in danger of becoming extinct? We know that uh, scientists at the National Museum of Natural History have um, a quick step-by-step -step method for predicting the future of species in their specimen collections. And I'm going to go ahead and put a link uh, into the chat area that will also be posted after the event uh, uh, for people to follow up on. Uh, but it's a, a nice, uh, for those of you who are, of course, uh, asking questions around this, it's a great resource to take a look at. Um, what yeah, I, I, I think I'm probably going to have to start wrapping this up right now. I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of questions. But we just got another two inches of snow here, so um, we, I, I'd like to kind of sign off by saying uh, let's all go to the tropics and see where a lot of this exciting biology is happening. And we'd like to sign off by thanking you, John, for uh, despite the crazy conditions, uh, using the last bit of battery life for us rather than calling friends or neighbors uh, to, <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to help and join in the, uh, the blackout conditions there. So thank you so much. Um, okay. And I'll stay on and do a couple of quick pieces of wrap-up. We will let you go with our sincere gratitude. Okay. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening. Take care. And we would like to encourage you to keep this dialogue going. Um, this was a great anchor point for discussion on this topic, but there are many ways to continue that discussion. Let me just point out a couple of those. First of all, I hope you will join uh, people like Alvin and Wang and Horng and Adrian, who are joining us from Singapore today. They are... Um, educators who are going to be interacting in the Shout Teacher community and continuing the conversation. And you can find that at the partnersinlearningnetwork.com site. You'll find links to that at shoutlearning.org as well. We'll include this in a follow-up note to you as well tomorrow so you can get all the most important links you need. There's also a great teacher's guide that you can find if you are a teacher. And even if you're a student, you might enjoy the guide as well. And that's uh, also located uh, from the shoutlearning.org site as well as from the various partner sites. And there's some special workspaces available at the Taking It Global website, and we hope you'll check those out. It's a great way for all of the students who are with us today to keep the conversation going. Um, so we'll include links to all of these places to you. And don't forget, if you're a Facebook user or a Twitter user, Shout is on both Facebook and Twitter. You can visit us at facebook.com slash shoutlearning or follow us at shoutlearning on Twitter. So I hope you've enjoyed today. I did want to point out that we have another conference coming up in this whole continuum of live events and of exploration and acting and exploring. And that next event takes place in March. So you can check that out. Um, we will let you know. If you haven't already, you can register for that event uh, right off of shoutlearning.org or off the website that you access to get here, smithsonianconference.org slash shout. 
So thanks to everybody, and uh, I know he'll go come back and check the archive later, so let's all go ahead and add our thanks to the chat box to John for uh, make, doing everything that was needed possible. He even, I should mention, abandoned his car on the side of the road uh, to uh, hop aboard other means of transportation to be sure he could be in a place where he could lead our session tonight. So thanks to him and his valiant effort to be here. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon. Glad to have you. And if you're still with us, we hope you'll complete the evaluation at the top left corner of the screen. We'd love your feedback uh, for today's session. So please take a moment and click on that evaluation link. Just a quick few thoughts from you about um, the benefit of today's session for you and your exploration. Thank you.